So .NET and the .NET framework. Uh, .NET is the newest version of the .NET framework. Uh, version 6 is where we're currently at. Um, and that is the version that is going to get the long-term support. Uh, .NET is free. It is cross-platform. It is open source. And you can create all sorts of different types of applications using it. Uh, the three primary languages uh, that create .NET applications are C Sharp, F Sharp, and Visual Basic. And so when we say that this is cross-platform, it means that you can develop code uh, using Linux, Mac, Windows. Um, you can execute code on those platforms uh, in addition to iOS and Android. Uh, the .NET framework was the original implement implementation of .NET, and the newer .NET is cross-platform. Okay. Prior to .NET, uh, you had to run uh, web apps on Microsoft servers. And now that it's cross-platform, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, the apps, the implementation for mobile uh, is Xamarin or Mono, uh, which we don't cover, <laughs> but just kind of an FYI. Um, and I think it's probably easiest if you see like a little graphic of the process here. So no matter what language you're using, uh, after you write your code, you compile it. And it creates, assuming you don't have errors, uh, it creates an intermediate language file that's either going to be a dynamic link library file, a DLL, or uh, executable file, an EXE. And so that's what happens here in the common intermediate language. Okay, and your program can sit there <laughs> literally forever. Um, but when you decide to actually run the program, okay, then the CLR takes over. And this is what's kind of neat about the framework is that it looks at your computer architecture and it uses what's called a just-in-time compiler to transform the intermediate language code into machine language. So because it does this transformation, when you are ready to actually execute the program and run it, uh, the program is more likely to work on future machines. So that's kind of the, the neat thing. It's kind of a future thinking framework that uh, we are working with, which is kind of neat. That's not how things have been done in the past. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, .NET uh, framework in a nutshell. Uh, and then if we kind of come down here, um, so what would prevent your code from compiling or running correctly? Uh, well, obviously that would be errors. <laughs> so <laughs> um, our Code Easy tutorial says there's two types of errors, but there's actually three. Uh, we have syntax errors, and um, if you have a syntax error, your code is not going to compile. Um, if you use Visual Studio, it's actually pretty easy to find these errors. In fact, I have a little code here. I'm going to make a uh, syntax error. We'll just forget to put a couple of the closing semicolons on here. And I'm going to try to run this. And, and what it does is it compiles it first. And then it asks me if, it, if I want to continue from the last success, successful compilation. And I'm going to say no, uh, because I have errors. And so here you can see uh, it's kind of telling me it's expecting a semicolon. Okay. And so if I double click on that, it does take me to the line where it detected the problem, but you'll notice that the problem is above that. Okay, 
And same with this one. Now you'll notice once I correct the error, it's gone. But if I double click here, it's actually detecting the error below where it occurs. And this is pretty normal. Okay, so then I've got another error. And that is because I have text that um, I'm reading in. When you use read line, it automatically uh, assumes that you have a string. And I'm trying to store it in a double variable. So I need to do type conversion here to fix this error. Okay. And I would have to do something similar here as well. Okay. But you can kind of see how easy this is uh, to fix when you use an IDE um, like Visual Studio. And IDEs are kind of made for ease of use. Okay. And then when you have a warning, you can, you, I mean, you should look at it, but it, this is not going to prevent the program from running. Okay, so you can see that it is running. And let's see. Ah, so I've got another error in here. Uh, it is not showing me the correct balance. Okay, so I got rid of my syntax errors, but the pro and the program ran, but it's not giving me the output that I expect. So this is a logic error really. Um, and if I look here, I've got string interpolation here, but I forgot the dollar sign. So I would think that would give me a syntax error, but it didn't. Okay, so it just basically printed out the dollar and the curly brace. And that is why you always have to test your programs. All right, now it's working exactly how I expected it to, and I have corrected all the errors. Okay, so we had syntax errors in there, missing uh, semicolons. We also had a logic error. Um, runtime error. This happens um, when usually bad data is entered. <laughs> Um, that's the the most typical kind of run runtime error. But if you can prevent, if you can figure out ahead of time uh, what a user might enter for bad data, um, then you can kind of remove that type of error from the equation because you can handle it. Um, there is something called exception handling that also will allow you to handle errors that you can't predict ahead of time. And we'll cover though that later in the semester. But for now, if I had a situation, I'm going to pause this so I can uh, create a little situation where I'd be dividing by zero. All right, so I've got this little uh, program in here uh, where I'm not really checking what they enter for the denominator. So you can see I'm not getting a syntax error on it, right? Okay, there's no syntax problem. So I can enter a numerator, I can enter a denominator, and as long as I don't enter a zero, you know, the program is going to run just fine. Okay, although the dollar sign probably shouldn't be there. Okay, now if I run this again though, and I enter a zero, I got a runtime error, okay? And it's saying system divide by zero. So it's actually giving me a pretty darn good message. <laughs> so um, telling me uh, what the error is. So if you can think of these types of situations, it is best to put code in to avoid the situation from occurring. So if I say, if the denominator is equal to, oops, actually it guessed here. So I'm just gonna press tab to accept it. If it is equal to zero, 
Then I'll probably put out a little message. All right, and so actually then I'm going to probably We'll just do that one line there, but then for the else, we're going to do two lines. We will do the calculation and the print. All right. So now we are handling this. So let's save and we'll run it again. I got to stop it from running. Save it and run it again. All right. So first we're going to make sure it works with good data. Okay, so that still works. And now we will make sure that we don't get the exception error. We'll do 20 and 0. There we go. We have handled that error. Okay, so that is a runtime error. So logic errors, uh, I showed you one of those before. Uh, your program typically does run, um, but the results are not accurate. Um, and I like to show these using algorithms. Um, and something simple like your morning routine. Uh, what is the matter with the order that you are performing your morning routine? We turn off the alarm, we get dressed, we eat breakfast, we shower, we drive to work. Can you spot the error? Uh, well, if you do things in this order, you're going to arrive to work wet. So you should really shower before you get dressed. Okay. And the way that you catch these errors is through testing. Uh, that brings us to repetition. We get into doing looping today and we are going to be covering for loops. And for loops work great if you know ahead of time how many iterations you want. So how many times do you want to go through the loop? That is the number of iterations. And the way that you write for loops, and this is true in pretty much every language. Uh, it's the keyword for, and then you're going to have three different expressions, and you've got semicolons in between. The first expression is for a counter that you initialize. This is optional. You can initialize the counter above the loop um, or at the beginning of the loop, but it does have to be initialized somewhere. And then you have an expression that you're checking. And so typically you're checking the counter against a value. And as long as that expression remains true, you're going to stay in the loop. Uh, expression three, you are incrementing or decrementing the counter. Okay. And again, this is optional in this position. You can certainly put it in the loop instead. However, most developers put all three right in the for loop. Now, if you forget to increment or decrement the counter, you do get into an infinite loop where the loop just never ends. Um, so I've got a couple examples. This first one, the developer determines the number of times the loop processes. So if you look at this code, you can see that we've got i set to 1. And we're going to stay in the loop while i is less than 11. So we're going to go through it 10 times. Okay, And each time we go through the loop, i is going to increase by 1. And then we've got enter number. And then because we started I at one, it's going to say enter number one, enter number two, enter number three, you know, each time it goes through. And then we're just adding 
whatever number they enter into our total. And once they've done this 10 times, we are printing out the total. Okay, and all of these little uh, programs you can copy and you can either go into .NET Fiddle or Visual Studio. You can actually paste them and you can run them. Okay, so enter number one. And I always try to do numbers that I can kind of manually add up in my head so that I know they're right. Okay, 550 is right. This little example allows the user to determine how many times the loop is going to process. So there's a prompt in here. You know, how many items would you like to buy? We read in their number of items. And then we've got some variables that we are declaring and initializing. So one thing uh, new developers get confused about is, you know, when do I need to initialize something? If you are going to be adding to a variable, then you need to initialize it so that you know it's starting with a valid number. If you are going to read input directly into a variable or you have an assignment statement or you're putting a value into the variable, then you don't need to initialize it. So for double and quantity, you can see down here that I'm reading from the console and I'm putting a value directly into them. Okay, so I know they're going to have valid numbers. For grand total, I am not using an assignment statement or um, reading anything in from the console. What I'm doing is I'm taking the grand total and I'm adding in the price times the quantity each time. So it's really important that grand total start with a valid number, okay, which is zero. Okay, so I've got my variables that I have declared and I initialized grand total. And then I've got my loop. And I'm going to start this at zero. And I'm going to stay in here as long as I is less than the number of items. Because I'm starting at zero, I am using less than. Okay. And then each time I come through, I'm adding one to I. Okay. And so because I is zero, I did have to change the way the item number is displaying, right? Enter the price for item number zero does not look very good. I'd rather have it say, enter the price for item number one. So I'm just adding one to it here so that it, it displays in a more user-friendly format. Okay, and then uh, you see I'm reading that in, uh, enter the quantity, reading that in, doing the calculation, staying in the loop however many times the user indicated, and then when we're done, I am printing out the total. So again, you can see this run. If we copy and paste the code, I'm not gonna have it run too many times. I'm just gonna have them buy two things, the price of item one, 10 to 50, enter the quantity one, <laughs> the price of item two, that's $20 and we'll do two. Okay, so 50, 50 is correct. And you can see how that works. Now, off by one error. This happens in all types of loops, um, but especially in a counter controlled loop. Um, and it it's the problem is that when you're initializing the counter and you're checking your condition, um, you end up running the the loop one too many times or one too few times. And so just the, a general rule that you need to remember is that if you initialize the counter to zero, 
then you need to use less than when you are checking the condition because that way it'll it'll go through the correct number of times because it's starting at zero. If you use less than or equal to, your loop is going to run one too many times. Okay, and so in that example we just looked at, I've got less than items and I did start at zero. So what if I did less than or equal to? Okay, I'm going to run it. And last time I did two, right? So I'll do two again. And now you can see it's forcing me to do another one. And this is the off by one error. And again, that is just because we're starting at zero, we cannot use less than or equal. We have to do less than. Now, the other form of this happens when you initialize a counter to one. If you initialize the counter to one, then you do need to use less than or equal to. Okay, so if I left it like this and I did not change it to less than or equal to, I'm not doing the loop enough times. I'm going to be one short. Okay, so if I run this and I do two, and you can see I'm done. It did not let me do it again. And that is what happens when you use a one for your counter and you use less than. To fix it, you'd have to use less than or equal to. Okay, so these are very typical errors. Uh, and hopefully you guys will remember these little tips so that it doesn't happen to you. Um, now we get into arithmetic shortcuts. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen these used because um, I'm pretty sure they're in some of the examples. Um, uh, might be in some of mine, but also code easy because uh, this is pretty standard. Um, there is an increment and decrement operator. Uh, for incrementing by one, we use plus plus. And for decrementing or decreasing by one, we use minus minus. And it does save you quite a bit of typing. So instead of doing the variable name is equal to the variable name plus one, you just have the variable name with plus plus after it. Now, one thing you do need to realize about uh, incrementing and decrementing is if you put the plus signs after the variable, okay, or the minus signs for that matter, um, it's gonna go through the loop the right number of times, but it will actually, you know, increase or decrease that counter one final time before it falls out of the loop. And it's probably easier to see this when we are incrementing. So in this little example, um, I ran the program and you can see I've got I++. So it went through and it did all five, which was awesome, right? So it comes through here again, and because it is post incrementing, it increments before it does the check. Okay, so for this last time, when I is five, it goes ahead and it changes it to six. And then it says, is six less than or equal to five? It's false, falls out of the loop, and it comes down here, okay? And that's why I had to adjust the counter I here because it would have said six. So let me show you this without the adjustment so you can see that I am telling you the truth. So let me take that adjustment out of here. Okay, and let's run it. Enter the price of item one. We're going to do this really simple. 
All right, so I entered the five items, but then you can see it says your total for six items. And that's because it went ahead and it increased it here and then it did the check. Okay, so I just be aware of that. There is another format of incrementing and decrementing, uh, but we aren't covering it quite yet. So for right now, um, we're gonna keep this format and this is, honestly the one that you use most often anyway um, and you just kind of have to be aware especially in a for loop of when this thing is increased or decreased um, most of the time we use incrementing however you can decrease uh, by one as well so i did include an example of decrementing so uh, decrementing, you actually, and it's kind of a weird uh, thing, you actually have to set your counter to your high end, your maximum, okay? And then you're gonna stay in your loop as long as it's greater than zero. And then each time you loop, you subtract one from the counter. So you can kind of see how that works. Okay, so it's just a little different processing. In addition to having incrementing and uh, decrementing to save us a little coding time, uh, for all the arithmetic operators, if you have a variable and you are going to add something to it or subtract something from it or divide or multiply, you can use this nifty little shortcut where you take the operator and an equal sign, and then just simply the value. And the value could be a variable or a number, okay? But if I wanted, if I had a total and I wanted to add to it, I can say plus equal 10. Uh, if I want to subtract, minus equal 10. Okay, so here is a little example where I'm adding to price whatever they've keyed in at the keyboard. And I'm using plus equal. So that is a, a little shortcut that is very, very common. Nesting structures. Uh, so the way programs are set up is uh, they are sequential, right? They run from top to bottom. And then within that sequence, you can have repetition and you can have selection. And you can nest those structures inside of each other. So we could have a loop inside of an if else, or we can have um, a loop. And then inside that loop, we can have an if else. And that was the example that I uh, decided to set up for you guys. Um, so we've got employees. And we're dealing with salary and hourly workers. So how many employees you want to enter? Uh, they then key in a number. And we're declaring some variables here. You'll notice I'm not initializing any, which means that I am either reading data from the council into the variable, or I'm performing some kind of a calculation, and I'm assigning the result to the variable. Okay, but we've got type hours, rate, pay, and overtime. So I'm going to stay in this loop um, as long as you know we still have employees to process based on whatever number they entered. And then I'm asking them to enter a one if it's a salaried employee and a two if the employee is hourly. Okay, I'm reading that into type. And then You'll notice I'm inside a for loop. I have an, a nested if else. And in this nested if else, I am checking the type. So I'm checking to see if it's a one, in which case there's salary. So I'm asking for their salary and we're reading it in. Um, otherwise, I'm checking to see if it's a two. And if it is, they have to enter their pay rate, which I read in. They have to en enter their hours, which I read in. And then I'm handling overtime. So if their hours is greater than 40, um, their overtime would be 
you know, the hours minus 40. So if they work 50 hours, they'd have 10 hours of overtime. And then they're getting time and a half on their rate. Okay? And then their regular pay is the 40 hours times their rate. And then we add in their overtime. If they didn't work over 40 hours, we're just going to take their rate times their hours. Okay, so inside this nested if else, I got another if else. So I've checked to see if it's a one. I've checked to see if it's a two. If it's not a one or a two, they didn't key in the right number. Okay, so this is one of those uh, runtime errors that you can check for. Um, so I am just saying you selected an invalid option. Please try again. And they don't get paid. <laughs> Their pay is zero. Okay. So um, just a little more complicated example using nesting structures. And I encourage you guys to copy these examples, uh, paste them into .NET Fiddle or Visual Studio and run them. You can kind of play around with them because that's how you learn.